Well, guys, good morning. Good morning, church. I'm so glad to be here. As Tim said, my name is Daryl Nelson, and I am the minister of high school students here at Cross Life Church. Started the last week in June, spent my first week on staff here at student camps, trial by fire, um, and it was amazing. I love doing what I get to do. Uh, a little bit of background about who I am so you know a little bit about who I am before you hear from me. Uh, I was born and raised in northern New Jersey in the shadows of New York City, uh, Passaic County, hopefully somewhere close to that, all right? But we, uh, I grew up there, loved growing up there, was exposed to a lot, grew up in church. I uh, went to school in North Carolina at a place called Gardner-Webb University, and that is where I met my beautiful bride, Amanda. We were on the track team together. She was a 5K, 10K runner, and I was a hammer thrower. So it's really, it makes perfect sense that we would match up. She would run miles on end, and I would go five feet from the back of the circle to the front of the circle. Uh, but we love what we do. After I graduated up there, I followed her all the way to Alaska. Um, and I spent 14 years serving as a student pastor in Alaska. Uh, loved what I did up there, loved the people up there, loved the church I was at, but God was moving us uh, to somewhere else. And so the next obvious location was Central Florida. I mean, I feel like just covering the map, going all over the place. But we've been here uh, since this summer, absolutely love the church, love the people here, have just had a blast getting to know so many of you and look forward to years and years of getting to know more of you as we minister to the students here, but also just minister to the church as a whole. Uh, my family is looking forward to making this home and planting our roots in here. My wife, in the chaos of our move, because it's chaotic moving from Alaska to anywhere, especially to Central Florida. Uh, she made a statement to me as our stuff was finally getting delivered after like a two month delay um, that we're never moving again. So I better like it here. Uh, <laughs> hopefully you guys like me uh, won't go anywhere anytime soon. But this morning I was asked by pastor a couple weeks ago to fill in for him at the 11 o'clock service so he could spend the day over at the East Campus. And he wanted me to specifically share a little bit about our vision for student ministry, a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish as a church, what we're trying to accomplish as a ministry. But then also I want to challenge each and every one of you on something that you can accomplish in your life starting today. As you turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians, that's where we're going to be in a few minutes. We're not going to be there right away. But just go ahead and flip your Bibles over there, open up your app, do what you have to do. But I want to ask you a question while you're turning there. Have you guys ever made paper airplanes? I know what you're thinking. All right, it's up there. Like, why is he talking about paper? It'll all make sense here in a second. But I've never been a very good paper airplane maker. Like, I don't know if any of you guys struggled with this, but, like, I was the basic guy. I wasn't that guy that made, like, the helicopter that would soar for hours. You guys all know that guy. If you're that guy, I'm jealous, all right? But my paper airplanes were always the basic fold down the middle, create a wing on each side, right? And they never really flew anywhere because, well, they're terrible, right? Like, aerodynamics do not work in this scenario, right? You, you can't really, if I were to throw this, which I won't because I don't want to be embarrassed by it, but if I were to throw this, chances are it would nosedive pretty quickly or it would go to the left or the right extremely fast, right? But it would take a path. And this paper airplane, if we were to throw it anywhere in here, it would take a path of flight. If you're a science guy or a physics guy, you would know that that path that it takes is known as its trajectory, right? That's a fun word, right? Trajectory. And it's the path followed by an object moving through space. I thought about giving you guys all pieces of paper and like having you all make a pair of paper plane and we count to three and like throw it and see who could like hit a target and give away. Because that's very student ministry. But I figured we're in the adult service, we'll, we'll scale it back a little bit. So I'll just let you guys look at me make a paper airplane. But if I wanted to change the trajectory of this airplane, there's a couple things I could do, right? Obviously, I could fold it differently. I could use heavier paper because that would have more weight. Or I could do something very, very simple. Somebody showed me this trick years ago, and I've never made a paper airplane and not thought of this trick. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, but a paper clip. A very small paper clip at that maybe weighs an ounce, right? Maybe less than that. It's probably less than an ounce. But if you were to place this paper clip anywhere on this paper airplane as you get ready to throw it, it would change the trajectory of the way it's going. 
So if I were to put this paperclip on the nose of the airplane, in theory, especially if it was a better made airplane, it would go further and go straight. But likewise, if I were to put it on the wing, on the right side, as soon as I threw it, what would happen? It would fall to the right side. Same thing if I put it on the left. And there is actually people that if you put it on the back, it could do loops. Like there's, there's all these types of theories. Don't Google it because you'll be in a wormhole for the rest of the afternoon. Because I may or may not have done that in preparation. But I'm just telling you this, that guys, listen, the trajectory of an object can be altered so easily by something so simple as a paperclip. And see, here's the thing. It's no different in our lives. Every single one of our lives is moving on a path through our time here on earth. Every single one of us is taking steps one direction or another. Our life is moving down the path of life in one way or another. For today's context, let's talk about it in the Christian world. We're either moving toward God or away from God. Every single one of us falls in one of those two categories. I'm one of those guys that believes there is no neutral in the Christian walk. You're either radically pursuing Jesus or you're drifting away from him. And those are our two paths. Those are our two paths of trajectory. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us would say that our paths have been altered in some way, shape, or form by some sort of outside influence. And here's the thing, guys. There's, there's some middle school and high school students sitting in this room. Some of them are sitting in small groups right now on this campus. Some are sitting at home because they're not in church. Maybe they just go to the schools in our communities. Maybe they live in your neighborhood. And every single one of them falls into one of those two categories. Either they're pursuing God or they're drifting away from him. And every single one has influences pouring into their lives. Every single one of them has things going on around them, circumstances surrounding their lives that, it, that is affecting their trajectory, affecting the path in which they go. Sometimes it's stuff that's out of their control. Sometimes it's death of a loved one. Sometimes it's something as simple as illness, or maybe it's just the stress of school or sports. Maybe it's the consequences of a decision that they've made on their own. But everyone's life is being impacted by things going on around them. But you know what? Every single one of us, students included, especially students, are also being impacted by the people in their lives. The people that we interact with day in and day out, the people that our students interact with day in and day out, are impacting their trajectory more than anything else. whether it be their teachers, their coaches, their parents, their neighbors, their friends. Every single interaction impacts them in one way or another. I look at my life as a teenager, and if you knew me in high school, and you knew me in middle school, and you heard that, you know, 20 years from then, that Daryl would be a student pastor and working in a church in Central Florida, you would have laughed. <laughs> Because there's no way. I was living a different life. I was, I was consumed by my own desires. I, I was pursuing football rather than Jesus. Like all these things in my life, like there was nothing in my life that would point towards me becoming a student pastor. But there were people in my life that influenced me in a major way. The one that comes to mind, and I talk about this guy to our students all the time because he had played such a major role. So students, if you're awake still, hopefully good, all right. Um, just zone this out because you've heard this probably 10 times already. And I've only been here since June, all right. There's this guy in my life named Dale Patrick. Dale Patrick was a college student while I was in high school at Nyack College, right across the New York, New Jersey border. And he drove 30 to 45 minutes to church. He was an intern at our church. He was studying student ministry at Nyack. And so he would come and, and he'd work part-time at the church. And he'd be there at all these services. And Dale, for whatever reason, as a freshman, 
targeted me. Dale poured into my life. He invested in me in more ways than he probably should have. We ingested more 7-Eleven Slurpees than probably human, humanly allowed or recommended. He even, like, how many of you guys know what White Castle is? You guys know White Castle? All right, those of you that just raise your hand, you know the statement I'm about. He endured White Castle with me and all that that came after. I'll leave it at that. But you know what he did even more than that? He cared for me. He loved me. He showed me Jesus. He would show up to my football games. He would show up to my basketball games. He even came to track meets. And if you've ever competed in track or coached track, you know no one goes to track meets. (laughs) And he would come and cheer me on as I threw the shot put and I threw the discus. He would take me out and we'd go to diners and have late night talks about what Jesus was teaching me and what God was leading me in my life to do. There were a lot of days that the only reason I woke up and went to church was because I knew Dale was going to be there. But here's the thing, Dale was not the only influencer in my life. I look at the list of people that came along, the paper clips, if you would, in my life, that came along and it impacted the trajectory of my life. I think of guys like Dave Meyer, my first grade Sunday school teacher, led me to the Lord when I was six years old. Invested in me, prayed for me, even flew to Alaska for my wedding. That's commitment, because it was in January. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever been to Alaska in January, It's cold. (laughs) I think of a guy named Tim Berry. He was my high school Sunday school um, superintendent, I guess for a lack of a better term. Wasn't even a teacher. He just kind of ran the department. Prayed for me every time he saw me. He actually was the first one to speak my calling over my life before I accepted my calling as a pastor. He actually told me one day, he goes, Daryl, I think you'd make a great pastor one day. And I laughed in his face. I think of a guy named Moab Hanna. Moab was a medical student at the time, going to, to med school, and, and it would take time out of his crazy busy schedule and come and invest in high school students. He was one of my small group leaders. The list goes on and on. Rob Parker was one of my youth pastors. Jason Dewey, another youth pastor. Nick Simpson, Jeff Salveson, John Minima, my senior pastor, knew my name and invested in me personally. But it doesn't just stop with those people, because those are people you expect to invest in students, right? Leaders, pastors, youth workers. But it wasn't just them. It was the ushers that would greet me as I walked through the door and ask me how my football game went. Or it would be the, the lady, Mrs. Richmond, that would sit two rows behind me. My family was that family that sat right here, like second row, front and center, right here. You guys, you remind me of me, all right? And... Like three rows behind that was Mrs. Richmond. Mrs. Richmond, I felt like, was 98 years old for like the 13 years that I knew her, right? I think she's, yeah, she's really old. Like, but every time I saw her, she would let me know she's praying for me. She had no interest, like she had no vested interest in me as an individual. Like there, she had no reason to really care about what I was doing in my life, but she did. And she prayed for me. And let me know she was praying for me. And on our wedding day, we got a a letter from her, handwritten note, speaking blessings over our wedding and over our marriage. These are the paper clips in my life. These are the people that have influenced me in so many ways on my path towards Jesus. Which leads me to this statement. Church, Cross Life, our students need you. Our students need you more than you'll ever know. Our students need you to show them Jesus. Our students need you to be that community that wraps your arms around them and encourages them and challenges them. To be a teenager today is harder than it was 20, 30 years ago. There's more influences. There's more negativity out there than there ever has been before. There's more access to wickedness than there's ever been before. And they need the church to come alongside them. 
They need people that can then be that community, that can love them the way Jesus loved them. Why is it so important to understand this? Why is it so important to have this in our minds? The studies show it. The research shows it. You could read study after study that talks about the percentage of teenagers that leave the church after high school. The one most recent one that I read was 59%. I've seen anywhere from 40 to 70, but here's the honest truth. If it's anything more than 1%, we as a church should be concerned. We need to have a certain amount of energy being put towards our students. A couple years back, I, asked, I posed a question on Facebook because I was doing some research in preparation for a message, and I asked a very simple question. I asked two questions, actually. I said, if you're still in church, what is one thing that kept you plugged into the church as a teenager? And then the second question was this, if you've left the church, what might have kept you there? Can I tell you that I got some extremely honest and raw answers? Within a couple hours, the, the thread had over 150, 200 comments. There was one common theme that, that was there in, the, in the, the positive side of things. Like when I asked the first question, you know, what kept you in church? And it was this, older people, we'll use wiser people, all right? Wiser people who invested their time and energy and let, them know, let me know that they cared about me. Whew. Relationships. The Dale Patricks of the church the people that are investing in the students are the driving force to keeping them there. They're the ones who, who cheered them on. What a picture of the church. Generational ministry at its purest form. But on the opposite side of that, that second question cut me to the core. When I asked, why did you leave the church? And if you did, what would have kept you there? The number one answer, not feeling welcomed in the church body, feeling ignored, not connected beyond the youth, youth department. One comment in particular was a former student of mine from Alaska who had left the church. And he said, statement, he said, Pastor Darrell, I knew that you loved me, but I don't know about the rest of the church. Let that sink in for a second. I knew that you loved me. I'm just not sure about the rest of the church. What are we doing? Cross Life, let me ask you that question. What are we doing to invest in our students? What are we doing to build those relationships up? What are we doing to solidify their place in the church? What are we doing to keep them? What are we doing to draw them closer to Jesus? We're challenged. Even more so than that, we're commanded. This isn't a programming question. Can I be very clear? We don't need more Bible studies. We don't need more small groups. We need people that can love students. We need people to invest. People to come alongside and encourage. If you have your Bibles, open up to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Our students need you to show them Jesus. We have an opportunity to influence the trajectory of students' lives. How are we doing? Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse number 1. This is a passage you've probably heard before, but I need you to pay very close attention, especially to verse number 4. It says this, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Catch this last part. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That others is not just the people that you want in your life. 
Listen, I've been working with teenagers long enough. I know that sometimes they can be hard to love. Sorry, guys, but you know it's true. But this passage doesn't tell us to, to love those and come alongside those and, and care about the interests of those that have the same interests as you or the same type of person as you, same personality, same age, same demographic. No. Take interest in those of others. Church, we need to be looking out for the interests of our students. We need to be looking out for the interests of those that are walking in and out of these doors every week. Not just the ones that are coming here, but the ones that are in our neighborhoods. The ones that are in our communities. Man, some of you guys coach in the community. Maybe it be football or basketball or, or, or baseball. Are you considering the interests of those kids that are on your teams? Are you investing in those people? Are you looking out for them? Are you doing everything you can to show them Jesus, to show them the love of Christ? Our students need you. We need to be looking out for the interest of our students, and we have a responsibility to show them Jesus in the way that we interact with them. Maybe you don't know a single teenager in your life, and you count your blessings for that. I'll pray for you. Maybe, maybe you're, you're, you're racking your brain right now trying to think of teenagers that you interact with on a regular basis and you can't. Well, guess what? Just hang out in the lobby right after service. One's bound to stumble in front of you. It's not like you got to go looking for them. They're around everywhere. Invest in them. Take interest in them. Let them know you care for them. Take interest in what they're doing, in the way that you welcome them into the church. Shake their hands before service. I promise they probably washed their hands in the last week. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Some of them might be a little questionable. If that's your concern, like, go towards the high school side, not the middle school side. <laughs> Invest in them. Let them know you care. Let them know that you're praying for them. Ask them how you can pray for them. We're in the middle of a series on Wednesday night called Life Hurts, God Heals. And we're talking about just the hurts of life that come up in a teenager's life and the way to deal with them and the way to wrestle through them. And I did a survey on the first week of this series and asked what the hurts were. And guys, can I tell you that my heart was broken as I was reading through them? That are dealing with abuse, addiction, Grief, depression, anxiety. Guess what? All things that we could be praying for. All things that we can come alongside them and pray for them by name. Get to know one that you could pray for. Get to know your students that are around you. You can, you can have the responsibility to show them Jesus in the way that you encourage them, in the way that you challenge them, and in the example you set before them. In Titus chapter 2, we read about this a little bit. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse number 1, it says this. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, <clears throat> excuse me, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slave to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, and that the word of God may not be reviled. Verse number six, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, show integrity dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. We have a responsibility to set the example. We have a responsibility to show our students what it means to truly follow Jesus. 
We have a responsibility for us uh, to show our students what it means to love our family well. We have a responsibility to show them what pursuing Jesus looks like day in and day out. How are you doing? How have you done it? Are you doing it? If you were to examine your own heart right now and you think about the interactions you had with students or maybe interactions that you've had with your family that students have witnessed, how are you doing? One of my favorite things about being in student ministry is having students over to our house. Now that we finally have a house and we have furniture in that house and we're not sitting on like camping chairs anymore, like it's getting ready to start. <laughs> but not just for the relational aspect of getting to know students and them that, but I like them to see us on our turf. Than just an individual who stands on stage and teaches, but to see me as a real human being who has kids who aren't perfect angels. I know you're surprised. They put on a good, good show here at church. They save it all up. No, I'm just kidding. I have great kids. Except for that one right there. <laughs> He's the only one in here, so I can make that joke, all right? Um, but here's the thing. I love to open our doors and let our students see us interact as a family and where we get to model what a Christ-like family looks like. Because I know some of you in here might not be surprised to know that a lot of our students don't come from godly families. Maybe they come from broken homes, homes where abuse is present, or there's brokenness. We get to model that. In your life, how can you model Christ to the teenagers around you? How can you impact their trajectory? How can you come alongside them, guys? As a church, we have an example and a response, or excuse me, we have a responsibility to be an example to our students to impact their trajectory. Every single student, every single one of us in here, but for today's purposes, our students are this piece of paper right here. What are you going to do to help this fly better? What are you going to do to help impact this trajectory? What are you going to do to help come alongside them? How are you going to encourage them? How are you going to challenge them? How are you going to pray for them? What example are you going to set? Every single one of us, it's a paperclip. I know some of you are thinking, man, I'd love to be small. But something so small can be so impactful. Here's the thing. I know you're waiting for it. You're waiting for that ask of me to ask every one of you to sign up to be small group leaders in the high school ministry and in middle school ministry, which if that's your gifting and you're hiding from us, come reveal yourself. But that's not my ask today. I'm not asking for big things. I'm not asking for every single one of you to give up a week of your life and go to student camp with us. But again, if that's what you want to do, man, come find me. We'll use you. <laughs> but I'm asking for you to be the little thing. Be that small influencer. Be that example. Be the... The, the, the person in the church that's truly interested in our students. Be the person in the pew that gets to know the students' names that sit around you week in and week out. To pray for them. To come alongside them. To minister to them. Our students are watching Let's be intentional in the way that we lead them, in the way that we influence them. Let's do what we can to impact the trajectory of those in our lives. 
my mind automatically goes back to those men and those women that I talked about earlier. Dale Patrick, to this day, is one of my best friends. I know that if I'm in a pinch, he's a phone call away. He's serving as a student pastor still to this day. And I know that he loves me. I think back to all those other people that influenced my life and all those people that were the paper clips in my life and how much of an impact they made on my life and the direction in which it went. You see, because if it wasn't for Mr. Barry speaking the calling of being a pastor over my life when I was a junior in high school, I actually got the call when I was a freshman in college and I responded to the call in ministry. Who knows if I would have responded if it wasn't spoke over me years before. Because the moment that I felt that call, I thought back to that conversation I had with Mr. Barry. Every single one of us in this room, every single one of us in this worship center has an opportunity to influence those around us. To influence the people. And maybe this isn't just for students. This, this applies across the board. Maybe you have that neighbor that you can influence. Maybe there's that coworker that you could be that paperclip to. Maybe you have a needs to know who Jesus is. Will you influence those around you? Will you care for those that God puts in front of you? Will you care for those? Will you invest in those that God has placed in front of our paths? Guys, listen, it's not that hard. Can I tell you that there are so many students that walk through the halls of this church alone. As a student pastor, I beg you, love them. They expect me to love them. They expect my workers to love them. They expect their parents to love them. from Alaska said, I know you love me, but I'm not sure about the rest of the church. Let's not be that church, Cross Life. Let's not be that church where students don't feel welcome, where people in general don't feel welcome. Let's wrap our loving arms around them and point them to Jesus in every way possible. Let's do everything we possibly can to draw them closer to Jesus, to affect their flight of passage, or their flight of pa I went to Disney on Friday, sorry, that's how that came from. But affect their trajectory, right? Affect where they're headed, affect where they're going, okay? Let's be that church that comes alongside them and are the paper clips in life that go on the nose, not on the wing. Let's help them move forward, go towards their target of pursuing Jesus and not to drive them off. Because I think too often in our churches across the country and across the world, students feel forgotten, they feel left alone, and they feel ignored, so they walk away. We have a responsibility to be that example. There's an urgency to it. Our pastor has been in this series on the end times, and we've talked about this idea of we need to be urgent with the way that we minister to people. We need to be urgent in the way that we share the gospel with people. Guys, listen, that doesn't exclude students. If you have young kids that are in elementary or preschool, please don't use the excuse, I'll worry about teenagers when I have one. It's too late by then. If you've already raised teenagers, and you're like, we need your experience. We need what you've learned, the wisdom that you've gained. 
if you're in the thick of it and you're raising a teenager, you own one of them. Please know that as, as a church, we're praying for you and we want to assist you, not just their staff, but every single person in this room. Let that be our heartbeat. Let that be what we're known for. Let that be who we strive to be as a church. Let's be urgent about it. Let's not be complacent. Let's radically pursue Jesus in the way that we pursue students for Jesus. As you walk out later this morning, there's going to be teenagers standing at every door. And they're going to have something for you. They're going to have a paper clip. I know it seems minuscule. But here's my challenge. I challenge you to take one. Put it somewhere where you'll see it all the time. I have one in my wallet there for years. I don't know that I could take it out. It's like been like morphed in there. It's like stuck in there. But every time I see it, I'm reminded that I have over students, of the influence that I have, of the opportunity that I have to guide students towards Jesus. So I challenge you to take one. I challenge you to take it with you and, and, and keep it. Maybe you put it on your Bible so you'll see it every time you study God's word so you're reminded to pray for them. Maybe you tape it to a mirror. Can't really stick it on a mirror. Wherever it is that you'll see it and you'll be reminded of the opportunity that you have to change the trajectory of a student's life. As we move towards a time of prayer and closing, Maybe there's a student in here that you just want to pray for right now. Man, when we, go, when we get ready for this closing prayer and this time of, of invitation, don't be afraid. Get up. Walk across the, the worship center. I don't care. Grab them. Say, hey, I want to pray for you. Bring them down here. Let's fill the altar with, with people praying for our teenagers. Maybe you just want to come and just pray for them in general. Maybe you're in here this morning and God's been working on your heart and, and you just, you need to respond to Jesus and you just need to lay something at his feet. Man, when we start to pray, just come on down and, and pray. If you have been wrestling with giving your life to Jesus and, and asking him into your heart and, and becoming a Christian and following him with all that you do, man, grab one of the staff guys as, 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 we, as we pray and, and let them let you want to accept Jesus, and they'll show you exactly how to do it. So with every eye closed, every head bowed, as the band makes their way up for a time of invitation, I challenge us. Will we be a church that influences the trajectory of those around us? Will we be a church that influences the trajectory of our students? Will we be a church that cares. We pray for us and then the altar will be open. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. Lord, thank you for the students that you've brought into our lives here at Cross Life. Lord, I pray for every single person in this room, Lord, that you would put a burden on their heart to influence the trajectory of someone. Lord, help us to be the example that you've called us to be in Titus. Lord, help us to look out for the interest in of, of others as you've told us in Philippians. Lord, help us be a church that loves students well. It's in Jesus' name we pray.